My name's Tom Keel, and I'm the neuroscience communicator here at the Flory. My job is to translate all of the exciting research that the scientists are up to into uh, terms that we can all understand. Um, and we recruit our scientists on a regular basis to help me in my job um, do that with events like tonight. So tonight, Felice is going to walk us through the latest research in diet, mood, health and well-being, um, including, I hear, some very exciting microbiome research. So this is the gut-brain axis, which I'm sure many of you are interested in hearing about. So please join me in giving Professor Felice Jacker a warm flory welcome. Thanks so much, Tom. It's a real pleasure to be here. And, um, you know, as you've described, Michael is my, my research uh, father. He was already a professor when I came to um, do work experience with him when I was an undergraduate. And then I went into psychiatric epidemiology and nutrition, which he really didn't know anything about. And he thought I was a bit bonkers, but he was very happy to support me. And I went through and got my PhD in 2009 and have um, worked with Michael right the way through. So Michael generally, he, he really uh, leads the area focused on clinical trials, uh, nutraceuticals, which I'll talk a little bit about um, a bit later on. But my work really focuses on nutrition and diet. And although uh, the end point is very much mental and brain health, my passion is around public health. It's about nutrition. And there's a very good reason for that. Um, some of you may have heard of the Global Burden of Disease study. This is a huge study funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They run it um, every two or three years as an iteration. It involves over 1,800 researchers from around the world. It involves people from over 180 countries and data from over 180 countries. And it is the most comprehensive uh, study that brings together everything we know about health, what the risk factors are for disease, the amount of illness that is attributable to any particular disease and the impact of various risk factors on our health. And from this, what we know is two key things. One is that poor diet is now the second leading cause of early death across the globe. It's number one in middle and high income countries. It's number one in men. The only reason it's not number one is that you know, when children die, they lose a very lot, many years of life, and that accounts for more when they do the metrics. But basically, unhealthy diet now kills more people, and overnutrition kills more people than undernutrition does. And this is right across the globe. And of course, this is very much a function of the profound changes to our food environment. And these changes have come about because of globalisation, industrialisation of the food system. And we now have a situation where our whole food landscape has changed, what we eat has fundamentally changed, but of course it's happened quite slowly and incrementally, so people haven't really paid the attention to it that maybe they should have. So, as I said, globally, child and maternal malnutrition are number one, uh, but in middle and high income countries, dietary risks are the leading cause of early death. So these are just the data from the Large Global Burden of Disease Study. And when we talk about poor diet, what we're talking about are two things. So one is when you're not having enough of the stuff we know is really important for health, and the other is when we're having too much of the stuff that we know is directly detrimental to health. So these are obvious things that we know we should be eating. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, foods with lots of plant fibre, polyphenols, etc. Healthy fats, mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids. And on the other side of things, of course, we have fatty red meats, processed meats, uh, foods with added sugars, sugar-sweetened beverages. You would know that there's a big debate in public health at the moment regarding the importance of reducing our intake of sugar-sweetened beverages. And that's because they, by far and away, account for the leading contributors of uh, added sugars to our diet, by far and away. Um, and so the UK has just imposed a, a tax, and I think that it's inevitable here in Australia as well. It's just taking a bit more time. Trans fats, sodiums, etc. Very important to understand that um, healthy diets, unhealthy diets, they're not necessarily just the opposite of each other. You can probably think in your own life about people you know, and this often is true for young people, who would have 
maybe a very healthy diet at home. Their parents are feeding them the, the fruits and vegetables, etc. But then before school, during school, after school, they're going out and they're having thick shakes and sausage rolls and packets of chips and ice cream every night, etc., etc. Or you can get a situation, and this is not uncommon in children and in older adults as well, where people are not necessarily going out to Macca's and Kentucky Fried and eating all the junk and processed foods, but they're also not getting the good stuff. They're having a very limited diet, maybe white bread and sausages at home. So both of these things are important for health outcomes. Not enough of the good stuff, too much of the bad stuff. In Australia, even though we have access to wonderful fresh food, we're not uh, in the similar situation to the US where we have food deserts. Unless you're in a very regional remote area, you can generally access really good quality whole foods relatively easily. And yet we have a situation where less than 5% of Australian adults consume the recommended fruits and legume, uh, vegetables and legumes every day. And even more concerningly, less than half a percent of children. Now this we think is really um, critically important to understand in relation to gut microbiota and microbiome research, which I'll talk a bit more about a bit later down the track. But while we know that unhealthy diet is the leading cause of early death uh, in middle and high income countries, we also know from these large studies that mental disorders, substance use disorders, account for the leading global burden of disability. This means that they affect a very large number of people, impose much illness uh, in terms of not being able to fully participate in the workforce, in the community, and of course they're extremely expensive and very, very common. That large blue section, that's unipolar depression, the, the red is anxiety disorders, Depression and anxiety are called the common mental disorders for a very good reason. Now, the key thing to understand is that we have not had for many decades now new treatments for depression. Depression is, as you can see from that graph, the leading contributor to that pie. Existing treatments don't help everyone. In fact, they, they help less than half of people who do access treatment for depression. So we urgently need new, new ways of treating depression and also thinking about the prevention of depression. Now, if we think about the risk factors for mental disorders, many of them are not readily amenable to intervention and to change. So they're things like family history, early life trauma, life stress, social disadvantage, that's a big one, interpersonal violence. All of these things are risk factors for mental disorders that are quite difficult to change. However, the new research tells us that there's actually other factors that are modifiable, and these are what we should be trying to target as the low-hanging fruit to actually prevent mental disorders occurring in the first place, at least in some part of the population. So the work that we have led internationally, and which has now backed up the very extensive evidence from other people around the world, tells us that diet and mental health are linked. We've known forever that diet is related to physical illness for at least 30 years or so, but recently we've come to understand that it's also relevant to mental and brain health. So this is the study that I did for my PhD under Michael Burke, and it uh, ended up on the front cover of the American Journal of Psychiatry, which was wonderful because it was the first study to say if we look at the diets, in this case it was a very large, highly representative sample of Australian women right across the age range. We look at the quality of their diet, we did very detailed psychiatric assessments and looked at their clinical depressive and anxiety disorders. And then of course we take into account all these other factors that could explain a link. Things like income, education, body weight, how physically active people are, smoking, etc, etc. And we uh, you know, make sure that we take those out of the picture when we're looking at these, um, these associations. We showed that there was a very clear link. So women with healthier diets were much less likely to have a clinical depressive or anxiety disorder. Unhealthier diets were independently associated with an increased likelihood of these. Now, since then, there have been many, many, many other studies done from around the world, many of which we have led. Um, and 
what we now know is that across countries, across cultures and across uh, age groups, which I'll talk about a bit in a moment, the quality of people's diet is very clearly linked to their risk or their probability of having depression in particular. It doesn't seem to be explained by what we call reverse causality, so people changing their diet because they have depressive symptoms. This is important to understand and for that we need to look at what we call prospective studies where we take a group of healthy people at the start, we measure their diet, we follow them over time, we look to see who develops depression when they didn't have it at the beginning of the study. And so what we see from this, and this is a paper that I'm just working on at the moment with European colleagues, there have been several what we call systematic reviews and meta-analyses published since 2013 pointing to the, all the data that have shown that there's this link between diet quality and depression. And this is not yet published, but what it does is it looks at different ways of measuring diet. And of course, there's several ways that you can measure diet. But in this one, we looked at um, different scales that measure adherence to a Mediterranean style diet, which we know is a very healthy way of eating. It's not the only healthy way of eating, but it does have all the good stuff It has lots of plant foods, it has fish, it has lots of olive oil, it has legumes, these are the beans and chickpeas and lentils, it has nuts and seeds, it has a lot of diversity, it has fermented food in the form of uh, kefir and yogurt. So we know that this is a healthy way of eating and you can see that the data suggests that there's an approximate 30% reduced risk of developing depression for people who have a diet that is more like a traditional Mediterranean style diet. Similarly, when we look at other forms of ways of measuring healthy diet, uh, obviously in America or Australia, we don't tend to have a Mediterranean style diet, but you can have a different sort of healthy diet, one that is still high in fruits and vegetables, legumes, etc. And measuring diet in this way, you can see again, all of the data together tell us it's associated with about a 40% reduced risk or probability of depression. So this is just one set of data. There are many now out there. Now, really importantly, when we have our prevention hats on and we know that half of all mental disorders start before the age of 14 and that we need to be thinking about factors that can be modified to reduce the risk of developing it in the first place, we have led many studies in Australia and London elsewhere showing that the quality of young people's diets is very clearly linked to their depression. And it's not explained by things like family conflict, family, um, poor family management, adolescent dieting, family socioeconomic status, any of these things. Very, very clear links. So that's an important understanding if we're thinking about prevention. But in this study that I have up here, this was a study that uh, I led in Norway, looking at data from more than 23,000 mothers and their children. Now, we've known for quite a long time, since the 1980s, that what we call early life nutrition exposures, so this is what happens in utero, what, what happens in the first few years of life, is linked to the risk for chronic disease over the life course, so things such as obesity and, and heart disease. But we thought, based on the very extensive uh, evidence from animal studies, where if you feed a pregnant animal a Western-type diet or a high-fat, high-sugar diet, the offspring have a whole lot of changes that um, in the pathways that we know are relevant to the risk for mental disorders. So things like their immune function, um, their neurotransmitter systems, gene expression. There's a whole range of things that are affected by maternal diet and you can see it in the offspring. You can see this reflected in their behaviour. Was this true in humans? This is what we wanted to find out. And we investigated and this is indeed what we found. Mothers who have diets higher in junk and processed foods, just like what we see in the animal studies, the children have more of what we call externalising behaviours. So these are tantrums and aggressive behaviours and uh, anger. And these, along with internalising, which is sadness and worry and nightmares and crying, are what we call indicators of vulnerability to mental health problems as they get older. And what we also saw was, independent of what mum ate, what kids ate was really important as well. Both separately, not getting enough of the good stuff, or, and or having too much of the bad stuff was linked to higher levels of these internalising and externalising behaviours. 
again, not explained by socioeconomic status, education, a whole range of things, including mothers' mental health. Now, since then, another two big European studies have shown the same thing, and there are more data emerging that will be published soon. So this is a very consistent finding as well. And I think that this is really key too when we think about the other end of life. When we think about the ageing brain, dementia and Alzheimer's disease is becoming a, a very big problem globally as the global population ages and people are living longer. And we've known for many years that things that are indicative of dietary habits, things that are markers, things like overweight, obesity in midlife, high blood glucose, high blood pressure. These are all related to an increased risk of dementia. But we are also starting to see that the quality of people's diets is very clearly linked to their risk for dementia. And what we did with this study in collaboration with the ANU was looked at the size of people's hippocampi in relation to their diet. Now the hippocampus, two little tiny structures in the middle of your brain, that are very important for learning and memory right across the lifespan, from childbirth right, uh, childhood right to the end of life. Um, and we looked at people's diet quality and we looked at people's uh, hippocampal volume. And what you can see in these, this graph, and I'll just walk you through it, the blue bars, I'll get this, this one, hang on. The blue bars here are the, the size of people's hippocampi, the hippocampal volume at the start of the study. And this is four years later. Now what you can see there is the very depressing age-related shrinkage in the hippocampus. So that just happens, that's really depressing. But what you can also see is that there was a big difference between those with a poor diet, average diet and good diet. And this wasn't just a trivial association, this was the difference was about equivalent to about 60% of this age-related diminishment of the hippocampus. So it's saying the quality of your diet is really important for your brain health as you age. It gave rise to some very interesting and somewhat amusing headlines around the world. As I said, it's not, not true <laughs> if we look at the animal data. But it's just saying again that we have to be thinking about diet when we're thinking not only about our weight or our risk for heart disease and cancer, et cetera, but also for our brain health. Now, up until last year, what we had essentially was a very, very extensive and consistent evidence base from around the world telling us that there was an association between the quality of people's diets and their risk for depression in particular that wasn't explained by all these other factors. We also had a very extensive um, amount of data from animal studies showing that if you manipulate data you can change the brain, you can change behaviour, you can change the immune system, all of which is relevant to mental disorders. But we didn't have any intervention studies which is what you need in science to be able to say yes one thing causes another. So we went where angels fear to tread basically. Um, this was something that I thought about when I was doing my PhD and I could see that all of the observational data were coming in but also very aware that correlation doesn't equal causation. We need to test this using an intervention study. So I tried as best I could to get together a protocol to be able to try and answer this question that everyone kept asking us. Well, that's all well and good that they're associated but if I'm depressed, should I change my diet? This is what we wanted to understand. So. I was able to get some funding from the NH and MRC um, and we went where angels fear to tread. And this study was designed to investigate both the efficacy, so did it work, and the cost effectiveness of dietary improvement for the treatment of major depression. And very simply speaking, what we did was we recruited people with major depressive disorder, clinical depression. We randomly assigned them to one of two groups. They either had social support which we already knew was helpful for people with depression, or dietary support for a clinical dietitian for three months. And the sorts of advice that they were given was really simple. We made it simple, accessible, affordable, something that people we gave them all sorts of tools that they could use to make this feasible for them. So you can see here, these are not Yotalingi recipes. This is about getting the $20 crock pot from the op shop 
making up a big batch of bean and maybe some good mince soup with lots of vegetables on a Sunday and eating that all week. People with clinical depression very often have fatigue, a lack of volition, they don't want to cook. So we made it very, very simple. And what did we find? We really didn't expect to see anything, to be honest, because we could not recruit for this study. We'd hoped to get close to 180 participants. We could get 67 after three years of hard work. People with depression, I think maybe they thought this wouldn't work. Maybe doctors, psychiatrists didn't think it would work, so they didn't refer to us. We don't know why. But we found some pretty staggering results. So we saw that the people in the dietary group compared to those in the social support group, had a much greater reduction in their depressive symptoms. And indeed, about a third of the people in the dietary group actually went into what we had, full clinical remission. So this was really exciting. What we also saw was there was a very clear relationship between the degree to which people improved their diet and the degree to which their mental health improved. So basically, the more they improved their diet and their habits, the more their depression improved. So that was also fabulous. And this is really exciting because it's about to be published. We did a proper economic evaluation of these data. And what we saw was that people who got the dietary support cost, in terms of societal costs and healthcare costs, more than $3,000 less than the ones who got the social support. They saw other health professionals less often. They lost less time out of role. This looks like a really cost-effective way to treat depression. And that makes sense, because if you think about depression, all of these things that are risk factors for depression, like overweight, obesity, heart disease, diabetes, etc., depression is also a risk factor for those. So they're what we call comorbid. They very often go together. And so if you're treating depression using a dietary approach, you're also going to be benefiting the health of that entire person. So hey, isn't that a radical idea? To treat a whole person rather than just bits of their brain, bits of their cognition. Actually look at them as a whole and say, okay, let's get back to basics about diet, exercise, etc. I'll talk more about that in a moment. What we also did was a very detailed cost evaluation. Many people think that it's expensive to eat a healthier diet. We looked at this in really great detail and we showed very convincingly that the diet that we were advocating people adopt was actually more than $30 a week cheaper than the one they were eating when they came into the study. So people increased their fruits and vegetables, whole grains, fish, olive oil, etc. They reduced their junk and processed foods, the sweets, the biscuits, the cakes, etc., etc., and it was cheaper as well. So that's great news. And what's even better is that colleagues of ours in South Australia recently replicated this study. They did this in a group-based setting and they did have a much larger sample size. So people got either dietary workshops or social group, both of which were really, really popular. And again, they showed what we showed very similarly. These are the ones in the dietary group compared to those in the social support group. And again, they saw that people could change their diet and they really liked that this was something that was under their volition that they could take hold of and do for themselves. They could change their diet and the more they changed it, the better off they were in terms of their depression. So this is really exciting. Now, it does say something in the title about nutraceuticals and this is something that I'll talk to very briefly. But just to say that the literature around supplements is not very strong. Okay, so this is... Um, a study that was done by colleagues of ours, 2016, published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. And it tells us that there's, there's pretty okay evidence for these things as adjunctive treatments. That means for people who are already undergoing other sorts of treatment, if you add some of these, they can be effective and helpful. And in particular, the omega-3 fatty acids seem to be helpful for some people with clinical depression particularly if they have high levels of what we call inflammation at the start, which I'll talk a bit about in a moment. But on their own, no. Unfortunately, it would be really nice if we could just take a pill and have everything fixed for us, but there is no getting around the need to actually do much more of an overhaul than that. 
And it's really important too to just point out that with the SMILE study and with the Healthy Med study, these people were on other forms of treatment. They were on antidepressants or psychotherapy or both. This is not something where we're saying do this instead of, it's saying do this as well as, and this supports all of your other treatments. Now, uh, Professor Burke, who's not here, he has also led a really interesting and important program of research where he's looked at something called N-acetylcysteine, which is a, it's an amino acid. It is found in food, but they look at it in much higher doses than what you would get from food. And they've shown that it can be helpful for people with major depression, people with bipolar disorder, and people with schizophrenia. Now, what NAC does is it provides the substrates for the body to make its own natural antioxidant called glutathione and this protects the brain. So NAC is another one that we can consider. It's not available in Australia. You have to buy it on the internet. It's very easily to, easy to get in other countries, though. So that's the state of the nutraceutical research. is a little bit depressing. It hasn't shown a huge amount of uh, success, really, in, in terms of treating depression, apart from, as I said, the omega-3 fatty acids, which may be useful for people with, with clinical depression. And this methylfolate, which is a form of folate. SAMe is a strange product. It's very expensive. It can interact with other medications. It's not something that most people would recommend in routine care. Um, vitamin D, the, the evidence is pretty equivocal. There's some evidence that it's helpful, some that it isn't. So that's the state of play at the moment. Now, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I consider the most exciting area of research. Um, to again give you a background, at the end of 2016 I set up the Food and Mood Centre. At the time it was myself and two of my PhD students and I set this up as a website to act as a, an evidence-based resource for the general public. You know, people were saying, where can we learn about this? How do we find out about this? I can't read those scientific papers. What are you talking about? So we wanted to have something that was in lay language that people could access. It would also act as a resource for other scientists, for clinicians, and then, of course, to start showcasing the work that we were doing and to attract philanthropic and industry-based funding because we have no money. You know, we've had some funding from the NH and MRC, the National Health and Medical Research Council, but the last few years have been very slim pickings for medical research as a whole and in the area that I'm in, doing something that's a little bit on the edge or new and unusual, it's even more difficult. And happily, we've had a lot of success. So over the last 12 months, we've grown to be roughly at the moment about 20 postdocs, students, interns, with more coming all the time. And we're currently running a whole host of really, really interesting studies. Most of them are on the Food and Mood Centre website. If you're interested, you could go and have a look. But a real focus of what we're doing is on the gut microbiome. Because when we think about this relationship between diet and mental and brain health, we think that at least in part, it's working through the gut. Now, I became aware of the gut microbiome and its possible role in health and disease a few years ago now. Many of us did because we have new gene sequencing technologies that were starting to allow people to sequence and find out what actually was going on in there. But when you think about the human gastrointestinal tract, uh, you know, food goes in up here, comes down and, you know, gets broken up all the way down and then through this, this small intestine, anything that's digestible, so sugars and fats, etc., get absorbed into the bloodstream. But when you get down to this large bowel here, the only thing that's left is stuff that can't be digested further up and that's largely fibre. Fibre from plant foods, fibre from fruits and vegetables, from whole grain cereals, from legumes, chickpeas, beans, etc. Does this sound familiar? So what we're increasingly understanding is that the gut microbiota, the ones that live in here, the trillions of them that live in here, are actually doing a whole lot of stuff that's very, very important in affecting health and disease and actually just running our body. Now, we've known for a long time that there was this gut-brain axis via the vagus nerve, via these quite amazing uh, nervous system that the gut has. It's like a separate brain. It has its own nervous system. 
and it talks to the brain all the time and the brain talks to the gut. About 90% of the messages are going up to the brain and about 10% are coming down to the gut from the brain. We've known about that for a long time, but we didn't know about the bacteria and the other organisms that live in the gut and what they might be doing. So we know that we have at least 100 trillion microbes that live on us and in us. And they're not just in our gut, they're in our mouth, they're under our arms, they're in every single orifice, all across our skin. At least half of our cells are actually microbial. And even more astounding, 99.5% of our genetic material is not even human. So when we talk about the genome and looking for answers in the genome, well, 99.5% of that isn't even human. So we need to be thinking about what we call now the second genome. We are starting to understand that the gut microbiota in particular, this is the largest reservoir of microbiota in the body, they are, play a really fundamental role in metabolism and body weight. They play a very important role in immune function and increasingly we understand that they play a very important role in mood and behaviour and brain health. Now, I haven't got the time or this is not probably the right forum to go into great detail about how the bacteria do this. And needless to say, it comes, there's many different ways in which the gut microbiota seem to be having an impact on our health. But one of the primary ways is via their metabolites. So when the fibre gets down into your large intestine, the bugs get to work to ferment it, to break it down. That means they're getting the energy out of it. And in that fermentation process, they're producing what we call short-chain fatty acids. So these are things such as acetate, propionate, butyrate. These short-chain fatty acids affect virtually every cell in the body via what we call G-protein coupled receptors. They're receptors on cells right the way through the body. They influence how genes behave. They also, the gut microbiota, believe it or not, uh, create the conditions by which a whole range of important neurotransmitters are synthesised. So serotonin, dopamine, GABA, all of these key neurotransmitters are actually produced in the gut as well as in the brain. Now, they don't, as far as we know, cross the blood-brain barrier, but we do know that they're very important in signalling and signalling along these nerve pathways to the brain. So 95% of the serotonin in your body is actually produced in the gut. Another aspect of gut health that's really important is thinking about the gut lining. So the gut lining should have a nice thick mucosal layer on it that keeps the contents of the gut in the gut and not out in the bloodstream. But increasingly we're understanding that there's many things that hurt that barrier and allow the contents of the gut to actually spill out into the bloodstream. And what happens then is your body mounts an immune response to the bacteria or the undigested food products, etc., and creates what we call inflammation. And this is this low-level chronic activation of the immune system, which we know is a risk factor for depression. It's a risk factor for a whole range of chronic diseases. And it seems to happen at least in part by things that damage the gut wall. We're also starting to understand that things that are very common, such as higher blood glucose, and we're talking here about even high within the normal range, high blood glucose, which we already know is a risk factor for stroke, dementia, a whole range of things, also induces leaky gut from the other side. So these are just some of the ways in which the gut is involved in our health, but we know that it's involved in the integrity of the blood-brain barrier, in, in many aspects of the ways genes act in the brain. It's related to what we call in neuroinflammation. So this is inflammation in the brain. And we already know from many dietary studies in animals that junk and processed foods and high sugar and high fat can induce this neuroinflammation and have an impact on our memory and learning in animals uh, pretty quickly. So it's very important when we think about the link between our diets and our mental and brain health to think about what's going on in the gut. Because as I said, all of these aspects of our physiology that are related to depression, the risk for depression, such as this inflammation and oxidative stress and metabolic dysfunction, so insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, our stress response system, 
all our neurotransmitters, they're all modified by the bacteria in our gut. But they can only do what they do if they've got the substrates to do it. If they don't have fibre, they can't do what they do. They can't ferment and produce these short chain fatty acids, which do all of these key things. So when we think about microbiota and mental health, what do we know so far? Very, very simply speaking, some of the first studies suggest that if you breed mice without any microbiota at all, germ-free mice, they have altered stress response, altered brain plasticity, altered levels of neurotransmitters, altered behaviours, altered immune system, altered blood-brain barrier. These were the, some of the first bits of evidence. We know that you can change behaviour in animals by giving probiotics or bacteria of certain types. Amazingly, you can actually induce a depressive type behaviour in an animal by doing a stool transplant from a depressed human. You can also give mice hypertension by doing the same thing from someone with high blood pressure. So these are telling us that they're doing something that's actually causal. Don't really understand how, but this seems to be happening. So there's been a number of studies that have shown this. There's new studies that are suggesting that some probiotics might be helpful. This one looked at um, over 400 women during pregnancy in New Zealand. It was a randomised placebo-controlled trial and showed that those taking the probiotic compared to the placebo were less likely to develop postnatal depression. So this is some of the studies that are going on in the mo at the moment. You can just imagine how many people around the world are trying to, to do work in this space, but of course research is slow. So we'll hear a lot more studies being published over the next 12 months or so. But when we think about the factors influencing the microbiota, your age is really critical. Your early life gut microbiome as an infant is, plays a very, very important role in brain development and the development and training of the immune system. But by the age of three, it's pretty much established and it's like you have your own fingerprint, which is your microbiome. Geography, which I'll talk a bit about in a moment. Stress, when we're stressed, it slows down the gut, slows down motility, so food moves more slowly through the gut. And that affects the gut microbiome and the composition and health of the gut. So this is one of the ways in which stress affects the immune system because those uh, short-chain fatty acids, those metabolites that I talked about, they play a very important role in running our immune system. Infection, obviously, if we get giardia or a gut illness, and of course medication, not just antibiotics, but virtually any medication you take interacts with the gut microbiota. Sometimes that might be a good thing, we don't know yet, this is one of the things we're trying to find out. But the single most important factor so far that influences the gut is diet and what we eat every day. This is one study that showed that after only five days on either a plant-based diet with grains, legumes, fruits and vegetables, or an animal-based diet with meat, eggs and cheeses, you can see the difference um, in these are different sorts of short-chain fatty acids, acetate and butyrate. And you can see the changes. So basically, within five days, by changing diet, you could change levels of these short-chain fatty acids that I spoke about. This is a really important study that was published looking at the gut microbiome profiles of people who were living a traditional lifestyle in South Africa compared to African-Americans. Now, there have been a number of studies that have looked at differences, and they see, of course, very big differences in gut microbiome composition, including in children from Africa compared to children from Europe. They have a lot more diversity in their gut, the ones who are having a more traditional diet that has much higher levels of plant foods and fibre and much lower levels of added fats and sugars. Diversity, we think, is a good thing. It's like having a really healthy ecosystem, a really complex rainforest. It helps to keep us healthy. But what they showed with this study, not only were there differences in the microbiome between the two groups, but the people, the African-Americans had much higher levels of these inflammatory markers in their bowel, which are indicative of risk for bowel cancer, which of course is one of the leading cancers in the West. It's almost unheard of in traditional communities where they're having a traditional diet. But what they found was just swapping their diets for two weeks, they could swap the healthiness of the microbiome and reduce the inflammatory markers in the African Americans and increase them in the poor South Africans who got the Western diet. That's in just two weeks. 
So you can change your microbiome really fast and it will have relevance to your health very, very quickly. If we think about the fact that the microbiome, particularly in infants, is so incredibly important in training the immune system from birth, and we think about changes to food production and how that's been reflected in a loss of diversity of our microbiome from hunter-gatherer times through to now, and we know this because we, we study these, these existing hunter-gatherer populations. This, of course, accords with this massive increase in allergic disease in young children that we're seeing. Melbourne is actually the food allergy capital of the world. It's one of the uh, asthma capitals of the world, but it is the food allergy capital of the world. No one really knows why, but there's a lot of speculation that this has something to do with it. There's studies that show that after four generations in animals of a low fibre diet, whole populations of their bacteria are wiped out and cannot be restored without a faecal transplant. Now, there's some microbiota populations that are exclusive just to humans. We should be getting at least 25, 30 grams of fibre a day from a whole range of different sources. We're generally lucky to get 10 or 15 max. And if you think about right back at the start where I said less than half a percent of children are getting their intake of vegetables and legumes, which is their primary source of fibre, just think about the implications for that. Think about the fact that the gut microbiome is really important for brain development. We know that there's many other aspects of the modern diet that affect our microbiome. Ironically, it looks like, and these are data from animals, so we don't know if it's true in humans yet, but artificial sweeteners that we get in, Coke Zero, Pepsi Max, all of those sorts of things, actually change the microbiota very quickly and induce glucose dysregulation in a way that predisposes to weight gain. So in short, that just means that these fake sugars, they might not have calories in them, but it's quite possible that they actually make people fat anyway by changing the microbiota. Emulsifiers that are very widely in processed foods, they strip the gut lining, they act like detergent to the mucus in our gut. Ice cream's a key uh, source of these, which is really sad. I really love ice cream. <laughs> but <laughs> we have to be thinking about, okay, what is in my food? This is not what my body was designed to, to absorb. So good for guts, plant foods, polyphenols. We see in animal studies that if you feed animals a high-fat diet, yes, it makes them really fat. If you feed them a high-fat diet and add polyphenols to them, these are the antioxidants in things like olive oil and red wine and dark chocolate, yay, um, all of these sorts and, and plant foods, it actually quite dramatically reduces the amount of weight they put on. So it helps to regulate our weight as well. Monounsaturated fats from olive oil and from avocados and from nuts, polyunsaturated fatty acids from fish and from nuts. These are really good for your gut. Fermented foods, of course. Yogurt, kefir, kombucha, tempeh, um, sauerkraut, things that are made traditionally, not pasteurised. These are valuable sources of the short-chain fatty acids, these metabolites and bacteria themselves. <coughs> Bad for guts, saturated fat. There's this nasty little group of bugs called Bolophila that seem to really like saturated fat and they're associated with lots of inflammatory diseases. Processed foods, added sugars, refined carbohydrates, binge drinking, really not good for guts. A um, little bit of red wine, great, too much, not good at all. So I've already touched on uh, the opportunities for early life prevention. If we know that the diet of mums is key to the children's mental health or certainly associated with it. We know that it's also associated with the mum's mental health. We know that the children get their microbiota from their mothers. They get them with it vaginally delivered particularly. They get it when they're breastfed. They get it when they start to go onto solid foods. They've already got the, the initial um, population in their guts. We want to optimise mum's microbiome so that the children have a good, healthy microbiome. So if we can approve women's diets before and during pregnancy, we will have improved mental health in the mothers, improved mental health in children, and improved gut microbiota in children, based on what we know so far. This is the hope. It's yet to be tested, though. We need to do a lot more research. 
So the take home message is that diet really matters to mental and brain health, just as it does to physical health. It operates at least partly via the gut microbiome through a number of different pathways. Fibre and polyphenols are really important to gut health. Processed foods, high fat diets, toxic to gut health. Diet is modifiable. Therefore, it's a key target for prevention and treatment. I've missed a word there, sorry. This is another important take home message. It would be really lovely if we could just pop lots of supplements and probiotics and continue doing what we're doing and have it all turn out okay. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. You have to actually change what you're sticking in your gob. We've had a lot of impact on the field, which has been incredibly gratifying. In 2013, I set up the International Society for Nutritional Psychiatry Research. Now has close to 400 members across the world. We had our first major meeting last year in Washington. We are having our next major meeting in London in September next year. Uh, we've had a number of very important publications that have had a big impact on the field and we're really doing a lot in, in the media and social media space. And in fact, in the last two months, we've had really good pieces, all quite separate pieces, not just regurgitation of the same piece, in the Wall Street Journal, BBC, NBC, CNN, The Independent in the UK. So we're really getting people thinking about this. And this is great because we've had public health messages about diet and obesity and heart disease and cancer for 30 odd years. It hasn't made any difference, particularly young people. 40% of young people's energy intake is coming from ultra processed food products. We're seeing evidence in the West of not only what we call, it's what we call malnubesity, overweight and obesity, but stunted growth, too much energy, not enough nutrition. Colleagues of mine at Deakin are doing incredible work in Victoria, out in the regional areas, and they're showing rates of overweight and obesity in primary school age kids that are over 40%. Once people are overweight, it's very, very, very hard to reverse it. And this is why focusing all our attention public health messages on overweight is problematic because people give up. They can't lose weight, so they think, oh, well, you know, bugger it, I'll just keep eating hamburgers. We need to get the message out there that it's about their mental and brain health. It'll affect them tomorrow, not off in 20 years when they might get a heart attack, but tomorrow. So this is why we work so hard to get this message across. This is the Food and Mood Centre website. There's lots of great information on there. We have blog posts. We're updating it all the time, so go and have a look at that if you're interested. These are just some of the members of the Food and Mood Centre. I've got to update this slide. Um, and I'm really pleased that I was able to speak to you tonight. I'm sorry I haven't left a huge amount of time for questions, but I'm not in a hurry. If you don't have to leave, I can stay for a bit longer.